gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Why, Lord, all does thou art glory? Do not pass me by, my Savior, 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 hear my humble cry, hear my humble cry, why? On orders thou art glory, who do not pass me by. One more time, pass me not to joy to see if you yeah. My humble cry, yeah, my humble cry, why on others thou art born, or in who do not pass me by, O oh, my Savior. Savior, oh my Savior, oh Savior, yeah, my humble cry, yeah, my humble cry, why on others thou art poor, do not pass me by. Our Heavenly Father, King of Glory, we thank you. We bless your name tonight. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the privilege you have given us to gather at your feet, to learn at your feet. Many people desire to see a day like this. Many people desire to sit in a place like this to learn at your feet but there are no more many are in hospitals many are in jail many are in all kinds of problems but lord you have given us this privilege to learn at your feet we ask lord that tonight you will not pass us by in jesus name we pray that you speak to our very hearts the areas that we need change in our lives, we pray that, Lord, you touch those areas and you will effect those changes in our lives in Jesus' name. We pray even for those who are joining us online, those who will listen to this teaching later, we pray that this word will plant a seed in their lives, in their hearts, in the name of Jesus. As we continue, we pray that your presence will continue with us. Bless everyone listening this moment. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. I want to thank God for another opportunity to gather, to learn and study the word of God. Also thank God for the opportunity. Thank our parents in the Lord for giving me the opportunity to, to teach this evening. Uh, I do not take this for granted at all. It is my prayer that whatever we are going to be sharing here tonight will make meaning in your life and plant a seed, a long-lasting seed in our lives in Jesus' name. The month of October has been declared as a month of perseverance. It's been a month of teaching and encouragement. It's a month of learning learning new things. As Christians, we have a duty in perseverance. 
it is true that many people are facing a lot of difficulties. People are going through a lot. The economic situation is hard. People are no longer looking for luxury. People are looking for basic things, food. So we, it is our duty, we have a duty to persevere. In the first sermon we saw Christians' duty in perseverance and we were encouraged to persevere in faith, to endure trials and temptations. Trials, temptations, distractions, resist the devil. Persevere in prayers and do not stop doing good. In one of the sermons, we encourage to be persistent. Persistence is part, also part of perseverance. In the midst of all the difficulties, we must persist, we must continue to strive. And we discover different areas in life that we, we need to be persistent. Persistence in human nature. There's always a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit is always willing. But the flesh is weak. And the Christian must persistently fight against disordered passion and self-will. The spirit must prevail over the flesh. If you don't remain in the spirit... There is no way the spirit will prevail over the flesh. So we must consistently remain persistent over human nature, over human wants. And we learn that human wants are insatiable. But God is our sufficiency. And Christians must struggle against wants and struggle against all those insatiable needs. Because God is our sufficiency. Other areas is human worries. Human beings worry over too many things. Worry about survival. Worry about the future. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? How will I pay my children's school fees? How will I pay my next rent? Well, look at what the Bible said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. He said, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. The owner of the life, the owner of your life says, do not be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about what you will eat. Don't be anxious about what you will drink. Don't be anxious about what you will put on. And that's what the Bible is saying. That is, is life not important than those things that you are worrying about? Is your life not more important than the things, what you will eat? It is the living that will eat. It is the living that will worry about things to wear. It is the living that will worry about shelter. And the Bible says, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about those things that you worry yourself about. He said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't keep into bands. They don't store into bands. Yet, God Almighty provides for them. How much more you? How much more you and me? Whom God has made after his own image. If God will pr pr provide for the birds of the air, how much more you? Why would God look away from you and not provide for you? He said, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Incidentally, most of the things that we worry about don't even happen. The things you are anxious about, that tomorrow you are so anxious about, the tomorrow will come and it will pass. So worry over nothing. Be anxious over nothing. He said, but if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? So the Bible admonishes us to be anxious for nothing. In everything, we should give thanks. We should be persistent. Four areas that we, we need to be persistent. Pers persistence in transmission of faith to others. Christians should be persistent in transmission of faith to others. In book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, verse 2, he said, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, 
the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So be persistent in your transmission of faith uh, to others. Someone told you about Jesus and you need to tell someone also about Jesus. Be persistent in difficult times. Life can be good. Life can be wonderful. We, ha we have testimonies of go the goodness of God. But life can also be difficult. And we need to face reality and share in the suffering. The difficulties that, 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 the difficulties that different people face at different times, are, they can be different for everybody. But we need to be persistent in these difficult times. And any time we face those difficult, difficulties, we should remember what Jesus has done. Jesus suffered for us. He died for us. So and any time we are facing this kind of suffering, let us remember that Jesus passed through those sufferings. We must be persistent for the sake of future promises. We must be persistent for the sake of future promises. If we die in Christ, there's a gl glorious future. There's a glorious future. In another sermon, we saw characteristics of people who persevere. And we saw that people who persevere experience failure like every other person. People who persevere, they experience failure like every other person. They fail. Sometimes it's not their fault. At other times, it is their fault. But no, other, no human being is above mistake. So people who persevere, they, pass, they experience failures in every aspect, in many aspects of life. But the book of Psalm 145, verse 14 says, The Lord upholds those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. So don't kill yourself when you fail. Trust God that God will lift you up. People who persevere choose not to live in the past. The past is gone. Forget about the past and move on. Move on to do other things. Move on. There are so many things you can achieve in life. So long as there is life, there is hope. People who persevere take one day at a time. People who persevere make the decision to always go forward. Don't go back. People who persevere know that God's strength is available unto them. And just last Sunday, just last Sunday we saw persevere to, persevere to finish well. Persevere to finish well. And we saw that the, the Bible enjoins us to run this race, this Christian race, we must run this race with perseverance. There is nowhere in the world that the Christian race is easy. You are faced with persecutions. You are faced with diverse forms of temptation. You are faced with difficulties. Because you are not going to join them to participate in the things of this life. So you, face, you are faced as a Christian, you are faced with a lot of challenges. But the Bible enjoins us to run this race with perseverance. The race that is set before us. And to finish well requires perseverance. If you want to finish well, if you want to finish this Christian race well, what are all those things that people are running up and down for? <laughs> At the end of the day, you will leave everything behind. What matters is the way you have lived your life and whether or not you have finished well. So it is perseverance that can make you to finish well. If you are able to endure those difficulties, if you are able to endure those challenges, if you are able to follow through, fix your eyes on Jesus. We do not finish well by, by focusing on the finish line because we do not know where the finish line is. So we must fix our eyes on Jesus. We must fix our eyes on the goal. Once upon a time, in, in Abuja, we were faced with serious accommodation challenge. We were about nine of us in a room. A self-contained room. But our eyes were set that this difficulty is not going to be forever. And today, everybody is living in his own house. So we must focus on the goal. What is that thing that you want to achieve? If your eyes are focused on the goal, whatever distractions that comes your way, you will, you will, you will, you will, not, you will not face it. So we must, we must persevere. 
we must follow through, we must endure, we must fix our eyes on Jesus if we want to finish well. And we need spiritual momentum to endure to the end. You cannot do it on your, by, by yourself. You need this spiritual momentum. We need this constant propelling force of the Holy Spirit in the direction of holiness to endure to the end. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10 verse 22 that he who endures to the end will be saved. My prayer is that we will endure to the end and will be saved in Jesus' name. Today we are looking at the topic Christian conviction. Christian conviction. And there are two characters in the Bible that we are going to be looking at as examples of conviction. First is Uriah. And the second character is Jephthah. A person becomes a Christian only on the basis of his or her belief. You become a Christian by giving your life to Jesus Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ. You believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary to save you from sin. So a person believes in Jesus Christ on the basis of his or her belief. And Christians are expected to live by one standard across the board in the family, in their career, and in their spiritual life. And the book of Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. So Christians are expected to live according to their belief. And what is this pattern of this world that we are talking about? The pattern of this world includes secular values. The pattern of this world is about materialism, self-centeredness. People prioritize wealth, they prioritize power, they prioritize uh, personal pleasure above spiritual and moral considerations. Those are the patterns of the world. The patterns of the world are a tendency to conform to societal norms and expectations. You want to just do the way every other person is doing uh, his things. Even when they conflict with Christian principles, you just want to do them. That is the pattern of this world. Conformity to the practices such as dishonest, dishonesty, practices such as greed, practices such as immorality. The pattern of this world often emphasizes self-reliance and the pursuit of self-interest at the expenses of others. You don't care about any other person. The pattern of this world cares you care about yourself. There's no compassion. There's no love. The pattern of this world emphasizes the pursuit of material possessions. And they believe that these possessions bring happiness and significance. People believe that when they are wealthy, it brings happiness to them. And I can tell you that the wealthiest people in this world are not the happiest people. Once upon a time, we were told a story of a very wealthy man. Just parked his jeep. And two boys were... Uh, walking past the, the vehicle. And the man heard them saying, ah, I wish I can be like this man. I wish I can be like this man. And the man heard them. <laughs> and he called them and said, come. When they came, he pulled one of his shoes. And behold, his, one of the legs was being eaten by leprosy. And he asked them, do you still want to be like me? <laughs> he said, No. So some of the people you see who are very wealthy, you don't know what they are going through. You don't know what they have put their hands into. So the, the pattern of this world is the pursuit of material possessions. And these people who pursue these things believe that it will bring happiness and significance to them. The pattern of this world is rejection or neglect for God. They neglect spirituality. They neglect moral principles in the favor of a secular or artistic uh, uh, worldview. But what is this conviction we are talking about? Conviction is a strong belief that governs our decisions and behavior. A very strong belief that governs our decisions and governs our behavior. Have you seen how some of the people in the opposite religion behave? 
when you are traveling on the road and your, your driver is uh, maybe someone of the opposite religion, and it is time for prayer, <laughs> the man doesn't care. He will pack the vehicle. He will pack the vehicle and go somewhere. If you like, complain from morning till night. He will go. When he finish prayer, come and start his car and move. You see some of them, the way they behave, they believe that, look, when they kill, they have a special place in heaven. That's conviction. You don't blame them. Many of them, that's how they, are, they were brought up. Right from childhood. That is what they have known all their lives. So if conviction is a strong belief that governs our decisions and behavior. And conviction can be strong that one is willing to die for it. It can be that strong. And there's a popular saying that if you do not understand anything, you will fall for everything. So in most cases, a person's conviction comes out clearly during crisis. If you want to see a person's conviction, subject the person to crisis. And human beings are like tea. And their colors show up when they are put in hot water. When they go through those kind of crises, that is when you will know what this person stands for. That's conviction. That's how strong conviction is. And there's a golden rule for Christians. And I also discover it also applies to other religions. See, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. That's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. And what does this, this golden rule do? It, the golden rule promotes empathy. It promotes kindness. It promotes the idea of treating others the same way, with the same respect that you want them to treat you, with the same consideration that you desire for yourself. And it encourages Christians to cultivate a loving and compassionate attitude. How do you want to be treated? How do you want somebody to treat you? So it encourages Christians to cultivate a loving and compassionate attitude in their interactions with people from all walks of life. And this principle, like I said earlier, it serves as a universal guideline for promoting harmonious relationship. Promoting understanding and also promoting ethical behavior. But the problem is that many Christians profess some belief based on the scriptures, but their conduct, their conduct in their family, their conduct in their career, their conduct in their spiritual life is different from what they profess. So you see a man come to preach like this on the pulpit, and when he goes back home, he's a wife beater. There's a, pa the, a pastor's son who confronted his father. I said, look, this man cannot preach to me and I will listen to him. Because he beats the mother at home. So their life, their conduct is different from what they profess. And the scripture should be the source of their belief. It should be the source of our belief. It should be the source of our conviction. And it should be the source of our conduct as Christians. Let's quickly look at the example of Uriah. Uriah. Uriah in the Bible is an example of conviction. I will find that story in the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 11 and in verse 1, 1 to 15. I'll just read briefly. I'm sure you know the story. Say in the spring, in the in the spring. At the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. And David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said she is Bethsheba. Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messages to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from the monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent a word to David, saying, I am pregnant. I'm sure you know the story of uh, Uriah's wife and, uh, uh, and David. 
It's a clear story of what some people will call betrayal. But our focus is on Uriah, who showed great example of conviction. And if you look at the verse from verse 8, then David, went, uh, sorry, from verse uh, 6. So David sent his word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. David, uh, Uriah was in the battlefield when David did that to his, uh, what he did to his wife. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a, a, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master servants and did not go down to his house. Uriah was worried. How can I go down to my house when I have left men in the battlefield? He was worried. He was convinced that he's at the wrong place at the right, the, at the right time. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How do you expect me to go home in this kind of condition? He didn't know that David had an ulterior motive. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and meet my wife? As surely as you live, I will do no such thing. That was conviction. He was convinced that, look, I'm not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be going to enjoy pleasure when there are people who are probably losing their lives in the battlefield. Then David said to him, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He refused to go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Job and sent it with Uriah. And in, in, in it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then draw from him. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. It was calculated. He knows that what he did was shameful. He has tried, made all the attempts to distract Uriah so that he can take ownership of the pregnancy. But Uriah did not even know what happened in the first place. And for him, he was convinced that where he was supposed to be at that time was at the battlefront, not going to meet his wife. He submitted to Joab even though he did not understand his orders. That's the moral, one of the moral of the lessons. He didn't understand the orders, but he, because of his conviction, he submitted to his master. He submitted to, to Joab. And Uriah's submission to Joab, even though he did not fully understand his orders, can indeed be seen as an example of conviction and loyalty. And his willingness was driven by his deep commitment to his superiors. He had that conviction. He had that commitment to his superiors. He has that unwavering dedication to his responsibilities. So that was his submission to Joab, even though he did not understand the orders, was an example of commitment. He slept with the king's servants instead of going home. That's another moral of the lesson in verse 9. I cannot go and be enjoying myself while there are men in the battlefield. He will not go home to his wife when fellow soldiers are on the battlefield. And this choice reflects his understanding of the importance of his role. His understanding of the importance of his role in the military and his willingness to prioritize his responsibilities over personal comforts. His willingness to prioritize his responsibilities over personal comfort. You know, when, when I was going through this uh, summer, one of the things that went through my mind is that some of us, a little thing, 
before I even to come to fellowship. Imagine on a Sunday morning and it's almost 8 o'clock and then the, the sky just turns dark. It's about to rain. Some people have gotten excuses <laughs> for not coming to church. Uriah's actions in this context highlight the strength of his character and his unwavering commitment to his role as a soldier. The strength of his character. His commitment to his role as a soldier. Another moral is that he cannot rest while the ark of God's covenant was in a temporary shelter. How can I rest when there are souls to win? How can I rest when there is work to do in the kingdom? How can I rest when my master is not at rest? The ark of the covenant was a sacred and central artifact in the Israelite region. And the presence signified the presence of God among, people, among the people. So the question is, how seriously do you take the things of God? How seriously do we take the things of God? How committed, how convinced... What is your conviction about the things of God? What is driving you? What is the passion that you have? Many of us are here today not because we just want to show our face in church. It is because of the passion. The passion to learn, the passion about the things of God. And one thing I always ask myself is if I don't come to church, what if every other person feels the same way and don't come to church? What happens to the, the house of God? What happens to the work of God? If I don't do a particular thing that I'm supposed to do in the house of God, what if every other person says I'm not going to do it? Who is going to do it? How seriously do you take the things of God? Uriah obeyed the king without question. He obeyed the king without question. That was on Sunday we had a meeting. A lot of issues were raised. What is your level of obedience? Or are you still questioning the, questioning the decision of our leaders? We have followed conviction. Even, though, even when he was drunk, he, was still, he still had that sense of responsibility. Uriah did not open the letter given to him. That's loyalty. If it was on people, they want to know which thing or guy even give me, make I even check. Whether or something will go kill me. Uriah did not open the letter given to him. The second character we want to look at is Jephthah. Jephthah's story is a story of wrong choices. Wrong choices or a poor choice. And when you, have wrong, when you make wrong choices, it can destroy one's conviction. If you make wrong... If I, anytime I read the story of Jephthah, I'm always heartbroken. Because a lot of people take decisions that destroy them. Some will see the warning, but they will ignore it. Wrong choices. In the book of Judges, chapter 11, verse 30 to 35, the story of Jephthah. The story of Jephthah in the Bible indeed provides... Valuable lessons about the potential consequences of making wrong decisions. Jephthah wanted to win a battle. And he said, God, if you give me this victory, this is what I'm going to do. If you make me victorious in this battle, by the time I return, the first thing that greets me from my, from my house is what I'm going to sacrifice for you. Jephthah forgot that he has an only child. Probably he was thinking that maybe he had it because people those days had animals, they keep animals in the house. So he thought maybe one of his goats would just come out and run after him when he returned. So it is a story that it, it, it provides valuable lessons about the potential consequences of making wrong or poor, choice, poor choices that can jeopardize one's conviction and have a profound impact on one's life. And one of the things, lessons is that there was hastiness in vows. Hastiness in vows. Jephthah was, he was too hasty. 
He made a hasty and ill-considered vow to God before going into battle. He promised to offer as a burnt offering whatever came out of his house to greet him after his victory. This impulsive vow led to a tragic situation. It was his daughter that was the one who came out to meet him. And the lesson here is that we should be cautious and thoughtful when making commitments or promises, especially to God. We should be cautious. I remember there is a politician. It's late now. I remember when he used to say, look, if I, if, even if it is for one day, I just want to sit in that house of assembly. Even if it is for one day. And people who make those kind of statements can go any length to get up what they want. And I'm telling you, the man did not live to even, he eventually got there, but he did not live to enjoy it. We must be cautious and thoughtful when making commitments. For one of my personal stories, there was a time I needed something badly. <laughs> and I went on my knees. And I said, God, if you give me this thing, I wrote those things down. And one of the things is that, look, the first money I'm going to be paid from this thing, I'm going to sacrifice it. I'm going to sow it as a seed. Eventually, God answered and gave me that thing. Lo and behold, when that money was paid, it was in the midst of difficulty. You know, don't, we, don't, we shouldn't joke with God. And that's why we must be careful about some of the things that we say. And if I part with this money, it's going to take me another 30 days before I can get another money. I didn't have hope for any other thing. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it was difficult. But I did it. So the, the, the moral is that we must be cautious. We must be cautious. For those who have not, uh, who are yet to marry, if I have an auntie who had uh, did this blood covenant, some people think take some of this risk without thinking about the implications. Went into blood covenant with this man. This thing destroyed their lives till today. They couldn't marry. They couldn't. They couldn't live apart. So their lives have been just destroyed. No direction. The man cannot put his hands on anything and it will succeed. The woman will not put her hands on anything and it will succeed. They tried to say, okay, let us marry and stay. They came back, they couldn't stay. We must be cautious and thoughtful when making commitments. Whether commitments to our fellow human beings or commitments to God. Another moral is consequences of ignorance. Jephthah's poor understanding of the potential consequences of his vow resulting in a heartbreaking outcome. And this underscores the importance of seeking wisdom. Seek wisdom. Seek counsel. Seek deep understanding of the implications of one's choices, particularly in matters of faith. Somebody just visited me this evening a while ago and was talking about marriage. He said, how, how did you do it? What did you see? How were you able to make this decision? <laughs> Seek counsel. Seek wisdom. Ask from people who are more experienced than you. Another moral is the importance of discernment. Jephthah's story highlights the significance of discerning God's will and seeking guardians in decision making. He did not seek God's counsel. He didn't consult with any religious leader. We are blessed here to have experienced people. Both spiritually and even in the secular world. Seek counsel. He did not seek God's counsel. He didn't consult with religious leaders before making it. Christians are encouraged to seek God's guidance. Ask God. In fact, that was the summary of what I told. I said, look, ask the Holy Spirit <laughs> to direct you. Marriage is a spiritual thing. It's not everything you see with your eye that is real. Seek counsel. Another lesson is repentance and redemption. While Jephthah's vow had, had tragic consequences, it also illustrates the importance of repentance and redemption. It serves as a reminder that even in the face of poor choices, you can turn back to God. You can go to God and repent. You can seek for forgiveness. And you can find redemption. 
In summary, don't make any decisions based on emotion. Think through things. Let Christian conviction guide your decisions. Let Christian conviction guide your decision. With that decision, whatever kind of decision you want to take. Not no decision is simple. Even the decision of the Virgo you should enter. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. I watched a video of one lady who entered uh, one chance. They took her somewhere and stripped her naked. By the time they collected everything from her, they did not even leave her clothes for her. They went with her clothes. Seek cancer. Even if you are applying for something, seek counsel. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. <laughs> Don't put uh, emotions. Remember the last time I traveled? In fact, every point I travel, I, I receive messages and calls. Some people will say, Don't come back. Don't come back. I'm telling you. Don't you have to you have to look at Don't, your decision should not be based on emotion. If not, you will make a lot of mistakes. Seek guidance. Pray. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to guide you through. And turn to God. Once upon a time, we went for a job. We went for a job interview. Many years. About, that was about nine years ago. We went for a job interview. Every other person went with letters. About eight years ago. Everybody went with letters from National Assembly, from where and where. And some of us didn't have anybody to give us letters. And we were just there. Then one man came out and he said something. He said, some of you, your destinies are not in this place. But you keep forcing yourself to come here. <laughs> and I said, this man is talking to me. Because clearly, my destiny, I knew that my destiny was not in that place. My father only wanted me to just satisfy him. He just wanted me to satisfy him. I have spent 35 years of my life in this place. Therefore, one of my child must walk here. I say it's not a must. It's not a must. And the man said, some of your destinies are not even here. And it was clear. Seek guidance to prayer and reflection. Turn to God for wisdom and discernment. If you pray, there is no way God will not give you wisdom. If Solomon prayed for wisdom, God gave him wisdom. If you pray for wisdom, God will give you wisdom and give you discernment. Pray, turn to God when seeking and seek for wisdom and discernment. When facing important decisions, study the Bible. Know God for yourself. The Bible provides a moral and ethical framework for us as Christians. Let, let, let not, any, not everybody has the right interpretation of the Bible. That's the truth. Some people interpret the Bible based on their emotions. Study the word of God for yourself. Identify core values of your faith. Love, compassion, forgiveness, justice. Seek God's will in every decision-making process. Seek God's will. God, what are you saying? What are you saying in this matter? I was just sharing with a young man. I said, look, there was, in fact, there was a lady I wanted to marry. And we decided that we should pray for 21 days. We should fast and pray for 21 days. And I remember one of the prayer points I prayed was, God, if it is not your will, scatter this thing. I'm telling you, before fasting and prayer finished, we have scattered the whole thing. Seek God's will. Strive to discern God's will for your life. This might involve seeking advice from fellow believers, seeking advice from pastors, seeking advice from spiritual mentors. Consider the ethical implications of your decisions. Ask whether your actions reflect the love and teachings of Jesus Christ. Remember we talked about the golden rule. Do unto others what you want others to do unto you. Does your actions reflect the love and teachings of Jesus Christ? Does your decisions reflect the love and teachings of Jesus Christ? Make decisions that prioritize service to others and compassion for those in need. Embrace forgiveness and reconciliation. Engage with Christian community for support. Strive for consistency between your beliefs and actions. Ensure that the choices you are making are in harmony with your Christian conviction.
Maintain humility in your decision making. Maintain humility. You don't know it all. No matter how much wisdom you have. Maintain humility in your decision making. Recognizing that as human beings, we may not always fully understand God's plan. We may not always fully understand God's plan. But trust in his wisdom. And the challenge this night is, are you a Christian? Or are you a church goer? It is not everybody who comes to church as a Christian. It is the life you live. Whether the life you live reflects the Christ that you profess. That is what makes you a Christian. Are you a Christian or a churchgoer? Do you live according to the standard of the scriptures? Or according to the standard of the world? We talked about worldly patterns. How are you living your life? Are you living according to God's standard? According to the scriptures? Or according to the standard of the world? Do you have strong Christian convictions? People who have strong Christian convictions, you don't push them about. You don't beg them. You don't plead with them every meeting. Do this, do that, do that. No. Strong Christian convictions will drive you. It will imprint passion in your heart. When you are not doing what you are supposed to do, that conviction will push you and say, you are not supposed to be here. You are not supposed to be doing this. Strong Christian convictions will imprint that passion in your heart. Do you live according to the golden rule? How are you treating other people? How are you treating other people? How is your behavior at home? How is your behavior in the secret? In conclusion, somebody is a Christian based only on belief. And your beliefs should govern your behavior. Christian conviction should help you to live according to the pattern of the scripture, not according to the pattern of the world. And we must make choices that will help us to live by Christian standard. And our prayer tonight is that God Almighty will help us to stand by our Christian feet, stand by our convictions and our conduct and actions. And I pray that this word that we have heard tonight will not stand against us in the day of judgment in Jesus' name. Let us rise up as we go to the Lord in prayer. What has God said to you this night? What have you heard? What are the areas that God is asking you to make adjustments? What are the things that God is speaking to you directly to change? Have you made some bad decisions or wrong or poor decisions in the past? You can ask for forgiveness. Have you made some vows out of ignorance? You can ask for redemption. You can go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. He is faithful. He is just to forgive from all unrighteousness. Ask God tonight for forgiveness for redemption. Ask God for wisdom. Wisdom to take the right decisions, to make the right decisions, to make the right choices. Wisdom to navigate through the storms of this life. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for the grace. Ask God for the grace to live by these Christian convictions. Ask God for the grace. Ask God to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct you in all your paths, in all your decisions. Let the Holy Spirit direct you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We thank you tonight for the word that you have spoken to us. We thank you, Lord, because we know that you have the power to forgive. In any way, Lord, that we have made wrong choices in the past, we pray, Almighty Father, that you will forgive us. In any way, Lord, that we are still experiencing the consequences of our decisions, Father, we seek for redemption. We ask, Lord, that you will free us from those consequences in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you will give us the wisdom that we need to navigate these storms of life. At the end of the day, Lord, we will finish this race well to the glory of your name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have heard and answered us. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen.